welcome to this tutorial series on microprocessors and design. I am Robert and today we are looking at the basics of microprocessors. In our last presentation we were briefly introduced to microprocessors. Alright, so before we get started, let's get to know the difference between a CPU and then a microprocessor. So if we say a CPU, a CPU is basically a central processing unit. So if we talk about a processor, a processor is some device or group of devices which has to manipulate a certain given data. So for instance, if we take a sound system, a processor could be an amplifier which multiplies our input signal by a certain gain. Okay. And when we talk about a central processing unit, a central processing unit is a group of devices or subsystems which acts to manipulate some given data or control other systems inside of the device or to coordinate activities of the device. And so a processor or a central processing unit could be implemented using wired connections or using discrete components such as resistors, transistors and what have you. And then if we implement this processor or central processing unit using integrated circuit technology, we call it a microprocessor. And in this course, we are going to be designing a microprocessor, although we won't realize it is going to be a simulated design using logic gates. So if we say CPU or microprocessor, we mean the same thing. All right, so this course, our prime focus is to design a CPU using logic gates. And so we are going to skip a lot of the details, but then I would recommend you to read Introduction to microprocessors by sorry, introduction to Intel microprocessors by Barry Bray contains a lot of information. All right, so if we take a simple computer, a basic computer, a basic computer consists of an input, a CPU, an output, and then a memory. Okay. So we give it some form of data and then the cpu does some processing on it and then it gives the output back to the user okay and so the cpu the data we are processing is actually stored in a memory before and after it is processed so for instance let's use the fufu pounding as an example so if our input is the cassava and then the plantain then the processing is pounding of the fufu and the output is the final of course the final fufu we are going to be eating we will revisit this picture when we learn the components of a cpu all right and so with a fufu pounding example we know we are pounding fufu and then this woman here knows where to get the cassava from the cassava is in a separate plate so all she needs to do is to take them put it in the mortar and this strong man over here also knows what to do so with the cpu a cpu is expected to perform some data manipulations so a question a question one may ask is how does the cpu know what to do and where does it even get its data from okay so that leads us to the stored program concept which is credited to john von neumann and then he says that instructions can be represented the same way as data and so if we wanted a cpu to multiply the the act of multiplying can actually be represented as a number which is stored somewhere in memory such that a cpu can fetch and then understand that oh, it needs to multiply so when you run a computer program what happens is that the program is loaded into memory as a sequence of instruction and so the cpu fetches these instructions and executes them one by one one by one and when we get to the design section it's going to be evident how we represent instructions using numerical values And so the CPU fetches the instructions and data it requires from memory. And then some systems, inside of some systems, the CPU uses the same bus. Now if we talk of a bus, we are talking about a collection of electrical conductors which carry some signals. Okay. 
So when we, some systems fetch both data and then instructions using the same bus. Other systems fetch data and instructions through dedicated buses. Okay. So basically, we have two forms of architectures used in processor design. We have the von Neumann architecture, and then we have the Harvard architecture. We are going to be studying the von Neumann architecture in this course. And in the von Neumann architecture, data and instructions are fetched using the same bus. So there is a block diagram of the von Neumann architecture versus the Harvard architecture. So in the von Neumann architecture, we can see that we have we have a bus here, and then that bus is carrying our data and then our instructions. In the Harvard architecture, you can see we have a bus for instructions and we have a bus for data. So this would be called the data bus. This would be called the instructions bus. And so we are going to be using this architecture over here, the von Neumann. C. Sorry, the von Neumann architecture. So when you power on a CPU, it does basically three things. Fetch instructions, decode that instructions, and execute it. That is all what a CPU does. So before a CPU can fetch instructions, that instruction must have existed somewhere in memory. Okay. So what, what happens is that any instructions we we want the CPU to execute, we make sure that we've preloaded all those instructions into memory. If it's not in memory, it means that the CPU doesn't fetch anything. Okay. So we define a computer program as a sequence of instructions which need to be executed by the CPU to perform a specific function. Alright, so I've explained the second point already. Let's move on to the next. So some instructions may be moving data, adding numbers, shifting numbers, multiplying numbers, dividing numbers, performing logical operations such as n or x, x or not, what have you. Alright, so the CPU itself is a subsystem. What we mean by a subsystem is, uh, if you look at a whole computer, it's just a single portion of the whole computer. And then if you take the CPU, it is also consists it also consists of other subsystems such as the ALU, the control unit, and then the register. Okay. We will come back to this later. So when you take a CPU, the CPU doesn't know the difference between instructions and data. It all depends on how it interprets it. Like we said before, we can represent instructions using numbers. We can also represent data using numbers and so for the cpu they are all just sort of numbers and like i said before if we have a dedicated bus for fetching data we call it the data bus and then we have an instruction bus for fetching data and then if we also have a dedicated bus for uh, fetching addresses we call it the address bus and then we also have the control bus which is used to actually send control signals and then any other bus which is external to the CPU, we call it an external bus. Alright, so like I said before, the CPU consists of three main parts, the ALU, the control unit, and then the registers. So the ALU, in effect, is a combinational circuit which is used to perform all logic operations, your addition, your subtraction, your end, and then your what have you and then we have the control unit the control unit is a sequential circuit and from data electronics we know that sequential circuits are timed circuits they are provided with a clock for synchronization and they perform some activities at certain intervals either the rising edge of the clock the falling edge or the falling edge of the clock so the CPU basically controls and monitors the execution of instructions. And then we have registers. Registers are also sequential circuits. They are used to store data temporarily. Then when you take a register, a register is just a cascade of flip-flops connected in parallel. And then they are all clocked simultaneously. What it means is that 
data can be stored on all flip-flops at the same time because they are clocked simultaneously. Alright, so let's get back to uh, Fufu analogy. And so we have the man here performing the, the processing action. Okay, and so we can see the man as the ALU because he is doing all the execution. The pounding work, he is the one doing it. And then we can see this woman here as the control unit because she is going to tell the man to pound whether or not to pound or to stop. Okay. And she is also going to tell this man over here at what pace he is supposed to do the pounding. Okay. And then we can see this motor here. This motor here, we can consider it to be a register. Okay. It's only serving as a temporal place whilst we pound the fufu. Because this is not where we are going to be serving our fufu once it's ready. Okay. So we can consider this earthenware bowl here as a, a temporal, a, sorry, a permanent storage device because uh, for us to eat, we are going to be saved here. Okay. But the motor here is only a temporal storage for storing the food whilst we pound it. So we can see this one as a register. Alright, so this is a block diagram of a CPU, a general CPU. So you can see over here we have an ALU, we have our control unit, we have registers, okay, we have IR here, IR stands for instructions register, and then PCE stands for program counter. They are actually registers, but special purpose registers. What an instruction register does is once we fetch instructions from memory, we store it temporarily in the instructions register for execution. Okay. All right. And then the program counter, what it does is that it points to the next instruction to be executed. So for instance, if we fetch instruction one, okay, program counter will now point to instruction two. So that the next time we come to fetch instruction, we won't fetch the old one again, we fetch the second one. So we will look at all these in detail at the design section. Then we have an address buffer. The buffer is just temporarily storing the address and then we also have a data buffer. Right. So our final in our final CPU design, we are going to have an architecture which is similar to this. Okay. Alright, so the next point is programming a CPU. Programming a CPU. As we said, the CPU understands only ones and zeros, okay? Ones and zeros are called machine language or machine code, okay? But we human beings, it's, it's going to be very hard for us to write complex applications. Let's say applications such as Microsoft Word, it would be very, very tedious writing it in machine language. So what we do is we use what we call high level languages such as your C, your C++, C Sharp, Java, your PHP and then all of these languages. So what they do is that they allow us to write our program using languages which are familiar to us. And then a program called a compiler will now com convert the high level language into an assembly language and then into a machine code. Okay. So when we talk of an assembly language, an assembly language is sort of in between a high level language and then a machine code. So if let's say 110 is the instructions for multiply, okay, instead of representing, instead of calling it 110, we, we might want to call it something like MUL more for multiply. Okay, so that's the difference between assembly language and then machine code. So that assembly language is basically naming the machine code instructions in a familiar way. Okay. Alright, so that's all for this tutorial. In our next tutorial, we are going to discuss, we are going to begin with our CPU design. We will look at the basic requirements for our CPU, so what should our CPU be able to do, or everything
that is needed in the design phase we are going to discuss them in our next section if you have any questions kindly drop it in the comment section thank you